Good morning, Calvary City Church. Those of you who are physically here, those of you who are online, we are all watching you. Um, I'd like to really, really tell that I was so blessed by the praise and worship. Awesome. Awesome. Ken, I'm sure that all of you online or physically, I mean, you would have felt the touch of God and it was awesome. Really, it is so, so, I really wanted it to go on and on and on. Okay. But all good things must come to an end physically, but let your praise and worship go on. Um, shall we start with, with a word of prayer? Father, thank you that you are here. Lord, your word says that you inhabit the praise and worship of your people, so you are here to accept us as we are. And Father, as we come before your throne of grace and mercy, we pray, O oh Lord, that today would be a day where our thinking would shift, where our values would change, where our desires, dear Father, would be transformed for your glory, for your name's sake. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you are a wonderful teacher, a counselor, a comforter. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here right now. You are here in this hall. You are here across people's homes simply because you were sent to counsel us, to comfort us, to speak to us. And that's precisely what you're doing today morning. So we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Lord, let every word that I utter be from you. Let the vibration of my vocal cords be what exactly you want to be voiced out to these people that you love so much this morning. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who is our Savior, we pray. Amen. Today I'd like to share the next 20 to 30 minutes something about altars. Alter, A-L-T-E-R. Now, we are 23 days into 2022. And there's something that we all need to do is to have an altar before God. So what is an altar? In, in the, you know, if you see the King James Version, the word altar is mentioned 433 times. And so many people, men of God, built altars. Noah built altar. Abraham built altar. So there was an altar of praise, there was an altar of prayer, there was altar of peace, there was altar of provision, all kinds of altar. But the basic line is this. The altar is a place where we encounter God. That's an altar. It's a place where we encounter God. And can I have the first picture, please? So this is how the... the the altar in the Old Testament looked like. You know, you've got four projections at the four corners so that when the, when, the, when the animal to be sacrificed is kept there, it's tied to the four corners. This is how roughly an altar looked like in the Old Testament. Now, this was the altar in the temple of God. Now, there are three components of an altar. You've got a priest who offers sacrifice. You have got an altar. And you have got a sacrifice. A priest, an altar, and a sacrifice. The components of an altar. So when we say build an altar before God, we need a priest. So we what? Call Pastor Rajan, Pastor Betty, Pastor Boy, Pastor Sebastian, Pastor Crystalline, Pastor Derek, and say, look, today I'm going to build an altar. Please come. We need an altar. And then you need stones. Then you need a sacrifice. What, what, what do you get with, to, 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 as a sacrifice? The annoying neighbor's cat? You, you, you take that? What, what do you get as a sacrifice? So what is an altar and how do we cater to the components of the altar practically in our lives? 
we need a priest okay first peter chapter 2 verse 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 9 you are a chosen people a royal priest who's the priest we all are priest okay so one entity is settled we've got the priest now we need stones first peter chapter 2 verse 5 first peter chapter 2 verse 5 you also as living stones so you got the priest you got the stone now you need sacrifice romans 12 verse 1 I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifice settled settled So we have got an altar within us we are the priest we are the stone we are the sacrifice Don't call any pastor don't call don't go and look for stones anywhere everything it's us but look many of us today feel that we are not qualified to build an altar before god we feel that we are inadequate we feel that i've got too much of sins i mean i keep repeating the same problems over and over and over again lord i am i am not good enough to build an altar everyone knows outside that i'm so strong but nobody knows how i cry at night anybody ask me how are you i'm good i'm good i'm good i have to say that i have to be brave in front of my family i have to tell show to my wife and children that everything is okay business is doing well nobody sees anything I just cannot be sincere enough to come to an altar before God. I just can't meet you God. I am lying too much. I am I am doing uh, things that are not right in my business. I have to survive. God, you brought pandemic and you want me to be the same person like before. It's not possible. Build an altar of stones. Deuteronomy chapter 27 was 5 to 7. Now this is the inherent character of the stone of the altar. You shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stone. Uncut stones. That means these stones are simple stones. You know the word of God says that when he asked the Israelites to take the stones just go by the river Jordan and just take the stones uncut stones not fashioned not chiseled not polished no rubies anything just plain old simple uncut stones because that is how that is who you and I are what God wants us to do is come to him prepare an altar just as the way you are No one is underqualified to build an altar before God. God wants unchiseled, unpolished, no artisans making special so no just as you are. All that he wants is a simple obedient heart. There is no one who is underqualified to build an altar before God. There is no one who is overqualified to build an altar before God. Nobody is too holy. Nobody is too smart comparing to the living God. So come today and let's make a commitment to build an altar before God. Now there are three components that I would like to share three things about the altar before God Just now we we sang the song you know uh, surrendering before God my heart you know that this act of surrender when it is sung it is so beautiful won't you agree with me it is so melodious and in a place like this to sing surrender is so easy 
But tomorrow when you go to work and you have to surrender your emotion, when you have to surrender your character, when you want to say something that you should not be saying and to surrender yourself, that is so difficult, man. Isn't it sometimes? You really, you want to say something, but you don't want, but, but, but you know it's not the right thing to say, but you just say it finally. To surrender yourself before God is not easy. Because if you look at all the verbs related to surrender, it, it's, it's all very unpopular verb, you know. To surrender means to give in, to submit, to concede, to back down, to throw in the towel. That's all surrender. We don't like these words. We like the opposite of surrender. To fight, to resist, to seize. This is what we like. Yet the word of God tells us that when we come to that altar, we are to surrender. We are to surrender. Now, contrary to our thinking, surrendering is actually a very easy thing, you know. It's a very easy thing. I dare say that we were wired as human beings to surrender. You know, in the book of Genesis, okay, chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them who Adam and Eve and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fulfill the earth and subdue it. What God was telling to them was, surrender your will to me. Surrender all that you do to me. Surrender your desires to me. And this is what I want you to do. So we are actually inherently, we are designed to surrender. And so much so when the serpent came, the serpent didn't say don't surrender. No, no, no. The serpent said surrender to something else. Surrender yourself to the tree of life. Surrender to the creation and not the creator. And I dare say that even Eve, Eve wanted Adam to surrender totally to herself, you know. You know, there's a story. I don't know whether it's true or not. Adam one day came back late. Came back home or cave or whatever they were living in. Then Eve asked, where have you been? And poor Adam said, see, I've got to go hunting, look for the tire, look for food, right? Are you sure there's no somebody else? And that night when Adam is sleeping, you know what Eve is doing? Poking Adam to count how many ribs. Whether there's one rib missing and another person has been formed. That's what Eve was doing. If you don't get the joke now, probably later you'll understand it. We all like people to surrender to us. Now, why is it that we don't want to surrender ourselves to God? What is the problem here? See, when we say that we don't want to surrender to God, surrender our time, surrender our tithes, surrender our life, we are telling that God, you are not worth it. That's, that's exactly what, bottom line, that's it. If I am not willing to surrender myself to God, inherently, what I'm indirectly saying is, God, you are not worth it. What I'm saying is, if I have difficulty to surrender before God, as I extend my elbow, stretch out my hands, extend it to God and say, God, I cannot surrender myself to you. What I'm saying is that what I have in my hands, I can't give it to you because you're not good enough to give me back, because you are not wise enough to give me back, because you are not gracious enough to give me back what is best for my life when I give up what is second best for my life. That's it. All that we are saying is, God, I cannot surrender this aspect because actually I'm not confident that you can give me something better. That is the struggle of not surrendering. We feel we are shortchanged by God. 
we feel that God, that when we give what we are giving to God, we are going to get something lesser from God. You know, there is a story in the Bible, and this is a real story, okay? In 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathayam, a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, not Tauhu, Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, not recommended. One was called Hannah, the other called Penina. Penina had children, Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Verse 4, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and all to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Apparently, I think he's not very smart at handling two women. You can't give one woman more than the other, right? I don't know, but that's what, I mean, logically speaking. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. So Penina would have said, oh, fine, Hannah, you get extra food. But guess what? I've got the kids. Day after day. Year after year. Verse 7. This went on year after year. When Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? This is a real blur guy, you know. Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Apparently not. Verse 9. Once they, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was leparking, oh sorry, sitting his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. See, priests are not supposed to sit, you know. Priests, you know, I was just reading. I don't know why Eli was sitting. Because apparently in, in the temple, the priest had no chair. There's no place for chair. But anyway, he was sleeping. Sitting, sorry. Now worse... 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Now, here is something that really flummoxed me. You know. Verse 7. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. You see him. You are depressed. You are distressed. You are humiliated. You are irritated. You are weeping. You can't sleep. Actually, in modern day, she has all the criteria for major depressive disorder. Really. And all this is because you don't have a child. And then you tell God, God, you give me, I'll give you back. I cannot understand this. You know, the, the depression that she went through was so real, you know. And so much so that they say that when she was uttering before uh, Eli in, in, the, in the temple, when she was talking, you know, there was no voice coming out. There's something in psychiatry known as conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is when you have so, in so much of distress and depression that that depression manifests itself physically. That means the problem is here, but it manifests itself physically. I had a patient, I think I shared about a year or two ago, 32-year-old lady who came, who was wheeled to the, to the consultation room, you know on a wheelchair. And then I said, uh, what happened? I can't walk. How long? One week. One week you can't walk. 32-year-old lady. Husband is pushing on a wheelchair. I said, okay. Now you cannot walk. No, suddenly you think of a stroke. So I asked her, any blood pressure, any diabetes? Um, you know, check the blood pressure. Everything was okay. 
uh, and then of course then you think of infection you know some sort of infection which is actually irritating the nerve and therefore she cannot move the limbs any history of fever past few days any neck stiffness no nothing so i said look you are a, not a hypertensive not a diabetic no high cholesterol you have not had any infection and suddenly you cannot walk did you fall down anywhere did you, you know like sleep on one side or i was just thinking of the more obsolete things not the more rarer things and i still couldn't figure it out then i said okay fine i'm going to refer you to a neurologist and see whether the neurologist can help you probably need an mri so i referred to professor john so professor john tarakan he's a very senior neurologist he saw examined and he sent for an mri mri came out normal clinically normal radiologically normal laboratory diagnosis normal but physically cannot walk how to correlate all this then dr john he is 60 over years old and he's been a neurologist for maybe 30 to 40 years he told the husband to wait outside close the door had his nurse there and asked this patient can you really walk tell me now can you walk she kept quiet if you can't i'm going to do a procedure whereby i'm going to take some of your fluid from the spine and that's going to be very painful can you walk she said yes i can walk got up of the wheelchair and walked not a miracle man then he asked her what happened i suspect my husband is having an affair i want to get his attention that's it two weeks two weeks the whole family is feeding her somebody is bathing her she's not taking care of the th the three children she's not breastfeeding her child nothing cannot walk and she could mimic it so well you know she's a teacher i don't know maybe she read through the internet and knew how to pretend you have got paralysis you know you know all that knee hammer test where you hit here and you supposed to kick all that is negative you know she can't do anything conversion disorder is real and the british journal of psychiatry says that what hanna had here was a conversion disorder whereby she actually physically couldn't talk because she was so depressed and yet this woman says lord you give me what i really want and i will surrender it back to you why what is this secret i want to know and this is real because if you see in um first samuel chapter 2 okay first samuel chapter 2 it says here that hannah first samuel chapter 2 verses 1 to 2 the lord has filled my heart with joy this is after she gets samuel i feel very strong in the lord i can laugh at my enemies now here's what happened she got samuel dedicated samuel back to the temple and then now she's so happy because she discovered something there is more joy in having a relationship with the blesser than the blessing let me tell you something this act of surrendering before god you are think you may be thinking you're giving the best to god but when you surrender to god you will get this joy not happiness happiness depends on what you have where you are what you own no joy is regardless of what you have where you are regardless of your relationship failures no this lady experienced joy when she surrendered something so so something so dear in her life she surrendered to experience even a more emotional ecstasy of joy that is what happens when we surrender to god you and i will surrender anything 
once we know God is everything. Hannah knew that. That God is everything for her. Surrender. Now, the second aspect of going before an altar is sacrifice. Sacrifice. There cannot be a chance to meet the real God, experience real hope in your life without sacrifice. Can I have the second slide, please? See, even the temple of God, that first area that you have to go through is an area of sacrifice before you enter into the tabernacle. Before you meet God. Now, this was the concept in the Old Testament. Now, as we have already understood, Jesus lives within us. We don't have to have a place to sacrifice. But the point here is this. We need to sacrifice. Now, I found something strange. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, this is Paul telling Paul, very smart guy, very intelligent guy, born as a, uh, he, he was given Roman citizenship because they valued his intellect capability. This guy is begging us by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Mercies of God. Mercies of God. Well, what is this meaning of mercies of God? See, mercy is you and I getting something that we don't deserve. That is mercy. But here he uses a plural, mercies of God. Now, when we surrender our life to the Lord, immediately we are entitled to getting the mercies of God. So here it says, by the mercies of God, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. So I'm getting something which I don't deserve. Or I'm getting something good in my life. See, mercy is me getting something that I don't deserve or not getting something bad that I should deserve. If I steal something, the punishment for me is A, B, C. But if mercy prevails, I will not get this punishment A, B, C. So mercy is me not getting something bad that I deserve to get. Mercy is me getting something good that I don't deserve to get. And here what it says is, by the mercies of God, present yourself as a living sacrifice. So what are these mercies? It's a plural. And actually, if you start reading the book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 8, if you see chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, it talks about divine love. That is the mercy of God, divine love to an unworthy sinner like me. If you see chapter 3, 4, and 5, it's talking about grace to provide salvation to a sinner. If you see uh, chapter 8, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. If you see chapter 1, chapter 2 of Romans, it's talking about peace. If you see in chapter 11, 20 times it's mentioned faith. If you see chapter 1, verse 12, it's talking about comfort. If you see chapter 1, verse 16, it's talking about power. All these are the mercies of God that I would get as I offer myself as a living sacrifice to God. That means the more I sacrifice to God, the more love I get, the more mercy I get, the more peace I get, the more joy I get, the more of the Holy Spirit I get. Now, this is an irony because because when you give, you think you get less. But biblical principle, as far as God is concerned, you give him, you will experience more mercies in your life. And, you know, when I was reading this, I realized it to be so true, you know. I don't know what I shared to you, with you before. Once when I, was, uh, uh, when, when I was in college, I was in this youth fellow, I mean, in this church fellowship, and I had a hundred, a uh, uh, hundred, I think a hundred rupee note. I studied in India. A hundred rupee note with me, you know. 
And then that was the only, only money I had in my wallet. And then the offer tree back came and the Holy Spirit told me, give. Give 100 rupees. Now we are all students, right? You know, right? Every dime counts. And if I were to give this, how am I going to go back? I got no money to go by bus. No gift. I said, oh, okay. I'm in church, right? Can't say no to God. Okay, so I gave. That 100 rupee I gave. My wallet is empty. Only my student ID card is there, which will not give me a bus ride. Then I go and I gave that money and I'm about to leave, not knowing what to do. The college is quite far away, you know, can't walk. And then this uncle comes to me, you know. And this uncle tells me, hey, uh, Manoj, you know about a year ago, I asked you to buy for me some guitar strings. I said, yeah, 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 I did. You know, you sent me, you gave me the guitar strings, but I didn't pay you back. Then I said, oh, okay, I totally forgot about that. Then he asked me, how much is it? Okay, well, this many guitar strings would call maybe about 20 rupees. He took out a hundred rupee note and gave it to me. And he said, you keep the change. I experienced God's generosity that day. The more you sacrifice, the more of his mercies you and I will experience in life. Now the third thing, and I'm going to close. So when we come before God, an altar of surrender, an altar of sacrifice, and now the third thing, an altar of service. Altar of service. Can I have the, the, the photo? You see, I like watches. Okay? Uh, it's my one weakness. No other weakness, just I like watches. You can ask Rachel. Don't ask, sorry, don't ask Rachel. You know all the other weaknesses. I like watches. Um, I like the, the art involved. I like to see the way that the creation of the watch. And you know, if you are a watchmaker, you, know, you have to be very dexterous with your hands. Your hands cannot have tremors and all that. You have to have sharp vision. You have to be so focused in what you're doing. You have to arrange the springs accordingly, the gears accordingly, the turbulence, the turbulence accordingly. It is a very, very delicate process, you know. But here's what I realized. When a watchmaker makes a watch, and this is what captivates me so much also, that watch is created for special occasions. Now, of course, you and I, we've got one watch or two watch for all occasions. But if you like watch, you realize it's so beautiful to see this watch is for what occasion? That watch is what occasion? Because accordingly, its structure changes. Its cosmetic varies. Its durability changes. So this first watch is a watch that you wear for daily use. Not too showy, but looks elegant. Next slide, please. Now, this is a watch that you wear if you are actually going for a black and tie event. Okay, next watch, please. No more. Okay. But the message that I want to tell is this. Yeah. So, this is a watch that you would wear if you are actually going for a camping trip. All right? So, what I'm now, there's quite a few watches, and before every. But, in case uh, all you women are wondering what to buy for your spouses for Chinese New Year, there are some suggestions here. Okay? And this is the last watch, which the kind of watch that you use when you're traveling. This is for casual wear watch. Okay? So the, the thing, the point here I want to, to make is this, you know. You and I are so much more precious than watches. So much more precious than watches. But if you think how a watchmaker makes a watch, he is so focused. Everything is so, it has to be perfect. Now, Psalm 139 verse 14. Here God says to David, You formed my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. The way the proteins are arranged in our DNA, in my DNA, is different from everyone else in the world. The way your proteins are arranged in your DNA that defines your sex, that defines your character, that defines the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, the build, your height, your weight is different from everyone else in the world. And the greatest tragedy is if you don't know why you are so specially, wonderfully, fearfully made. That is a tragedy. You know which is the richest place in the world? The richest place in the world? It is not in the new discovered oil fields by Sa Saudi Arabian company Aramco, no. It is not the gold mines of Uzbekistan or the diamond mines in Botswana. The most expensive place on earth is the cemetery, the graveyard. Because it is here where songs that were supposed to be composed were never composed. Where cure for cancer was supposed to take place but did not take place. Where inventions were supposed to, to, to be done but never took place. Why? Wrong purpose or no purpose. I want, I'm going to close now. And I want to close with Luke chapter 17, verses 11. Starting from verse 11. Now, this way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed. Now, basically, this is a story of the ten lepers getting healed. And they had to shout, you know, because lepers, when they come to town, they have to tell everyone, hey, I'm a leper, I'm coming, all of you, move out. It's not like the same, hey, I'm a dato coming, all of you, move out. It's, it's different, you know. Dato comes, they all want to come to you. Leper comes, they all want to run away from you. Now, Jesus healed these ten lepers. Now, these lepers, their life before this was the same every day. Every day they would wake up, do the same thing. But after meeting Jesus, their lives changed. They're not going to do what they did yesterday. But only one leper came back and built an altar of praise before God, before Jesus. And verse 18 was no one found to return the word return and give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said, rise and go. Before you go to fulfill your purpose in life, return first to your creator and build an altar before him. What is the Lord telling us today? What is the Holy Spirit telling us? What is it in your life that you need to surrender? What is it in your life that you need to sacrifice? Regardless of anything, let me tell you something. You surrender only to receive the best. You sacrifice only to get more of His mercies and you build an altar of service so that you and I will not end up in the grave not knowing what the purpose of our life was all about even after we were so wonderfully, intricately and fearfully made. Can we pray? Thank you, Lord. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, Lord. That, dear Lord, all the sacrifices only allows me to experience more of your mercy, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that I 
today choose to build an altar of service before you, Father. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Tell the praise and worship team to come forward. Father, we pray. We pray, O oh Lord, that today as we come before you, O oh Father, and we build an altar before you, an altar to surrender, an altar, dear Father, of sacrifice, an altar, dear Father, of service to you, we pray that you would accept us. Lord, you are there. Help us to come to you. Help us to run to you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you can get all your emblems ready. Lord, I give you my I give you my soul
me stand if you don't know jesus christ as your lord and savior but you want to surrender your life to him let me assure you you are sur- surrendering only to receive the best if you are that person please hear this prayer after me father father i come before you i come before you as a stone that is broken as a stone that is broken with no meaning in my life with no meaning in my life i have surrendered myself to everything of this world i have surrendered myself to everything of this world today today i surrender my life to you i surrender my life to you and make you lord jesus i make you lord jesus my personal savior my personal savior in jesus name i pray in jesus name i pray amen if you have prayed this prayer you can go can contact us online or you can meet any one of us we would like to meet you we pray for the communion father we come before you and lord we pray that you would bless these emblems these emblems dear father that we take metaphorically to remember what you did for us on the cross and father as we build in this new year an altar before you an altar dear father of surrender an altar of sacrifice an altar of service we pray dear father that you would accept us dear father we pray dear father that we would be able to come before your throne boldly dear father and lord as we take this communion let it be the first step dear lord in building this altar before you thank you jesus the lord on the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me let us eat the bread together supper he also took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me shall we partake the cup together thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you lord thank you father thank you lord you can put the cup the emblem aside how many of you believe that today you are a new creation Amen. that there is a new purpose in your life that you are going to be boldly going to surrender Amen. that you will boldly go and sacrifice because what you are giving what you are having now is the second best the best is there for you 
God never short changes anyone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Shut up, Mother. we thank you for your presence here we thank you Lord that you are a loving God full of mercies full of love full of patience full of long suffering full of provision full of every full of restoration full of healing dear father and we come before you to offer our life as living sacrifices thank you Lord In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, that everyone here would get a new vision in their life, dear Father, and start living 2022 with a life of purpose, of service, of sacrifice, of surrender to you, dear Father. Thank you, O Lord, for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Have a blessed week, everyone. God loves you. Thank you.